Well, I'm not sure if I can preach this morning or not. I was sitting over here crying. Well, I just appreciate each one and what you've shared this morning, your part in the service of Jason, the, uh, <clears throat> the devotional, the one verse, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. And I just felt his presence here today. And Gene, thank you for leading <clears throat> the song, In Need. Goes well with the message. <clears throat> thank each of you for your honesty and share time. Six weeks ago, we were celebrating Good Friday and Easter, which we know what those represent. Um, they represent a suffering and dying Savior, and then also a risen, victorious Savior. <clears throat> Today, I just want to uh, preach a message. It's actually a two-part message, but it is on our ascended Savior this past Thursday, we observed Ascension Day, <clears throat> and maybe we don't observe it as, um, as much as some of our neighbors do, but I trust it was on our mind. So my two-part message today is, first of all, I just want to look at the account of Jesus' Ascension. And then the second part is, why a resurrected, ascended Savior is better than a resurrected Savior that would have stayed here on this earth. Why would that be better? So if you care to turn to, with me to Acts 1, 1 to 11, I want to read that. That is where the account is found of Jesus' ascension. <clears throat> so I'll be just reading these 11 verses in Acts 1. And we'll look at these a little bit. Acts 1.1, 1, 1, and my passages are all from the New King James Version. The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach, until the day in which he was taken up, after he through the Holy Spirit had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during forty days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. <clears throat> Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father hath put in his own authority, but you shall receive power from when the Holy Spirit has come down upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me, in Jerusalem, and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Now when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who has taken you up from heaven, will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. We're familiar with this passage. I just want to highlight a few things as I read through this. Um, this as we think of maybe what was going through the disciples' mind, um, here was their leader, the guy that was with them for three years, taught them many things, all of a sudden uh, disappears but let's just look at a few things here. Verse 1, um, so kind of, we think Luke wrote this book. Um, Luke wanted to make an, an accurate account of what all that happened, what all Jesus said. 
And um, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day he was taken up. So Luke was accounting this, we believe. Verse 3. So this was after his resurrection. Uh, after his resurrection, uh, Jesus appeared to enough people. It says that he presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs. So that he left many proofs that this truly was Jesus. I was dead. I came to life. There was enough proof there, enough evidence that there should be no doubt and that there isn't. And then he tells them to stay in Jerusalem because of the Holy Spirit coming. Verse 6 and 7 was maybe something I think I missed um, even in previous times as I was reading this. Um, so here the disciples come again, or the apostles, whatever you want to call them. They, they said... Uh, is this the time that you're going to restore the kingdom into Israel? Um, they were still looking for this kingdom of Israel, uh, this, this earthly kingdom, as it were. And he tells them that it is not for you to know some of those things. Here's a quote from Matthew Henry. They were in earnest asking about that which their master had never directed or encouraged them to seek. And that's an earthly kingdom. Our Lord knew that his ascension and his teaching of the Holy Spirit would soon end these expectations and therefore gave them a rebuke. But it is a caution to his church in all ages to take heed of a desire of forbidden knowledge. I have to say, when I was reading verse 6 about the disciples' questions again about, you know, are you going to restore the kingdom? Is this the time? Um, you know, we can easily point our fingers to the disciples. Um, like, you know, don't you get it? Don't, don't, didn't you understand that Jesus is talking a heavenly kingdom? But I, you know, in reality, am I any different? I had a little time of confession before God because don't I desire a an easy life here? We like a Christian government because we have our own little kingdom here that's easy, that's that's easy to live in. Um we seek comfort, we like to be liked. Um wow. I I just yeah, it was a time of, of checking my own heart. And so often I desire is exactly the same, no different than wanting an easy life here. When really, all we need to know is the mission. And what is that mission? Is to know him and to make him known. That is the mission, is to know Jesus and to make him known to others. McLaren says this, and this gets to be a little poetic. Um, some of you may like poetry. I'm not into it all that much, but it gets a little poetic. But it kind of puts it in a nutshell of, of what our life here on this earth is. The New Testament <clears throat> gives little encouragement to a sentimental view of life. Its readers had too much to do and too much besides to think about for undue occupation with pensive remembrances or imaginative forecastings. They bid us remember as a stimulus to thanksgiving and a ground of hope. They bid us look forward, but not along the low levels of earth and its changes. Our great future is to draw all our longings and to fix our eyes as the tender hues of a dawn kindle infinite yearnings in the soul of the gazer. What may come is all hidden. We can make vague guesses, but reach nothing more certain. Mist and cloud conceal the path in front of the portion which we are actually traversing. But when it climbs, it comes out clear from the fogs that hang about the flats. 
We can track it winding up to the throne of Christ. Nothing is certain but the coming of our Lord and our gathering together with him. I hope you kind of understood what he was saying there, that we here on this earth need to continually look upward it's to that heavenly kingdom, <clears throat> to the kingdom of Christ. And then we have the ascension. While they were talking there, all of a sudden he disappears. Uh, it's like we watch a helium balloon. You know, we look and we look until it's gone. Uh, and I'm sure that's what they did. They watched and watched until they couldn't see him anymore. So that's the ascension part. Um, and we know that the, the disciples there were maybe struggling a little bit what to do next, but Jesus gave them a commandment, stay in Jerusalem soon. This will all make sense. Okay, for the second part of the sermon is, why is an ascended, resurrected Jesus better than a resurrected Jesus here on earth? So, when Jesus died, our salvation was complete. So, I, I like numbers, so let's do a little math. So, we know that if Jesus would have stayed here on earth in the flesh, he could have only been at one place at one time, right? And that's what he said. <clears throat> so, let's do a little numbers. Um, how many different places do Christians gather to earth on, worship on a typical Sunday morning? Now, if you do a Google search, you're going to find a wide range of numbers for sure. Um, anywhere from 2 million to 30 million. Um, and it may not all be church buildings, but one researcher came up with about 3 million. 3 million places of worship on a typical Sunday around the world. That may not even be close, but we're going to use that as just as a as an illustration here <clears throat> and he says about 400,000 in the United States which I can kind of go with that number um, so let's just let's do a little math three million places of worship and if Jesus would visit three churches a week two on a Sunday and a Wednesday night we're familiar with that that's when we get together usually so that would mean one million weeks how much is one million weeks? So you take a million weeks, you divide it by 52, that many years comes to 19,230. You think Jesus would have made it to Woodlawn yet? Okay, enough of that. So then, you take the Holy Spirit. Can be present every place, every Sunday. 19,000 years of work in one day. Anyway, you can argue the idea that if Jesus would be here, maybe he'd see more changed lives. Maybe, maybe not. Let me tell you, he was here. How many people listened to him? How many people got on the bandwagon with him? Not very many. One other instance we know, the rich man and Lazarus. Um, when the rich man died, he saw Lazarus in Abram's bosom, and he wanted Abram to send Lazarus back and warn his brothers. Because if somebody would come back from the dead, surely they would listen. You know what the response was? They have the Moses and the prophets. If they don't listen to them, they're not going to listen to somebody coming back from the dead. So, in reality, would more people listen if Jesus were here today? Maybe not. But through the Holy Spirit, we have the capability of being, having Jesus here every Sunday, every time, all the time with us. So we ask the question, so what is Jesus doing in heaven today for us? And when I started with this message, um, I realized when I got to some of the passages that it's our Sunday school lesson today. That's okay. Maybe you have some input after the message on that. <clears throat> so we have several words that kind of describe Jesus and his work in heaven. One is intercessor, advocate, which we had today, high priest, mediator, comforter, and there are probably a whole lot more. <clears throat> 
excuse me. <coughs> I picked three, even though they're they're very much the same and kind of intertwined. I'm just going to expound on those a little bit more. Um, there are several times in Scripture where it talks about Jesus being seated at the right hand of the throne of God. And when Stephen was stoned, it shows he saw Jesus standing. Um, but just the idea of Jesus seated at the right hand of God gives us the picture that is the highest place you can go next to the Father. So let's first look at an intercessor. And some of these may, you'd say, well, that goes better with the advocate or whatever. Uh, but first, intercess intercessor meaning someone who intervenes behalf on behalf of another person and and here this part of my message just thank you gene for minding the spirit of of leading that song in need because we are in need of somebody to stand in for us and to help us moses did some intervening when god wanted to wipe away the children he said, Moses, stand back. I'm going to wipe him away. And go Moses was standing in the gap there. And he said, well, let's not do that, please. Let's read Romans 8, 30 to 34. Moreover, whom he predestined, those he also called. And whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. What shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall we not meet with him also freely give us all things? And who shall bring a charge against God elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died. And furthermore is also risen, who is at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Hebrews 7, 24 and 25. But he, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. Therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. This making intercession goes to show his love for us and the power of his redeeming love and grace. I know this was mentioned in our Sunday school class along with the advocate is another term to use as an intercessor and advocate is a defense lawyer pleading our case before the judge. So when you look at our court system, it seems, it appears to us that the rich people that can afford the best lawyers often don't have to pay for their crimes to the extent that other people do. Uh, I think we can, we can, we know that, we see that happening. But so our earthly court system, we, we kind of have the same, uh, has kind of the same idea as what our heavenly court system does. First of all, you have somebody that does the prosecuting that is determined that this person pay for what they've done. And then you have the defense side that will defend this person and try to get him the least amount of, of sentence as possible. And then you have the judge. So in heaven, we have Satan, our accuser. We have Jesus, our defense lawyer. And then the judge, God the Father. And if we repent, the Bible clearly states that the verdict will be not guilty. Let's go to advocate. Advocate also is a, a synonym as intercessor and but it's one who supports, another definition for advocate is one who supports, one who comforts, one who's there for us. And that comes about in today's Sunday School lesson. My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. This passage here talks about two sides. Um, it gets a little confusing. I don't know. It's hard to explain it. You know, he writes, you know, I write these things so that you won't sin. So one side, sin should not be known by the Christian. Oh, we don't want to sin. But the other side is we will sin. 
And so we need somebody to stand in the gap for us and to help us, someone to support us and watch over us. Also, another word that is attached to Jesus and the work that he does is a high priest, a perfect high priest, one without sin. If you look at high priest, meaning in, the, in a dictionary, it's basically a very important person in a religious or spiritual organization. So we know a little bit about that with in the old Jewish law, how the high priest was the man that could, the, the gap between them and God, and that was through Aaron and the Levites who were called to that role. I'd just like to read uh, Leviticus 16, 11 to 16, just to refresh our minds what the, the high priest did under the old Jewish law. And this, this day of atonement was probably the most, um, his main work, the most important work that he did was on the day of atonement. Leviticus 16, 11 to 16 says, And Aaron shall bring the bull of the sin offering, which is for himself, and make atonement for himself and for his house, and shall kill the bull as a sin offering which is for himself. Then he shall take the censer full of burning coals of fire before the altar, from the altar before the Lord with his hands full of sweet incense, beaten fine, and bring it inside the veil. And he shall put the incense on the fire before the Lord, that the cloud of incense may cover the mercy seat, which is on the testimony, lest he die. He shall take some of the blood of the bull and sprinkle it with his fingers on the mercy seat on the east side, and before the mercy seat shall he sprinkle some of the blood with his fingers seven times. Then he shall kill the goat of the sin offering, which is for the people. Bring its blood within the veil, do with that blood as he did with the blood of the bull and sprinkle it on the mercy seat and before the and before the mercy seat so shall he make atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel and because of their transgressions for all their sins so shall he do for the tabernacle of meeting which remains among them in the midst of their uncleanness so that was maybe the most important work that the high priest did was to make that atonement to appease God for the time being. Okay, thinking about Jesus Christ as our high priest, Hebrews 2, 16 to 18. For indeed, he does not give aid, aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. Therefore, in all things he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in the things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered, being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. And then Hebrews 4, 14 to 16, Seeing then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Just thinking about this, that Jesus did that cycle. He left heaven. He came to this earth. He was, he, he was tempted in every way like we are so that he knows he understands he subjected himself to that so that he could better help us and then verse 16 just that invitation to come boldly to the throne of grace when we are in need he invites us to come boldly to the throne of grace so just try to wrap it up today I want to just read a few verses of what Jesus is doing today. One we know, John 14, verse 3 says, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So number one, our one is he is preparing a place for his people. He is doing that right now. 
The other one is in John 6, verse 40. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have eternal, everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. So Jesus is continually doing the work, preparing a place, and also making sure that as many people as come to him can be saved, can be helped. Uh, he is trying to bring as many people into his kingdom as he can. So he's busy. He is not sitting around um, doing nothing. And I hope this gives you comfort. He cares about each of us personally. He cares about each need, each problem, each struggle, each heartache, everything that we can go through. So I hope this gives you comfort because we have an advocate that is busy. He is fighting for us. He is on our side. He is defending us before God the Father. Satan is the enemy that's trying to destroy us. But our Savior is greater. He is stronger. He is more powerful. He is a way maker. He's a miracle worker. He's a promise keeper. He is the light in the darkness. That is who he is. You are here moving in our midst. You are here working in this place. I worship you. Even when I can't see that you're working, even when I don't feel that you're working, you never stop. You never stop working. And that's part of a song written by Michael W. Smith. Hopefully, we can understand that God is on our side. He is making intercession. He is fighting battles for us. Let's bow for prayer. Heavenly Father, we just come to you today. We thank you for Jesus and the work on the cross. And we thank you that he has ascended to heaven and that he is doing the work of an advocate, an intercessor, a mediator. Father, we just thank you for the Holy Spirit that is present here and that we can have access to you through him to help us with each battle, each struggle, and each thing that we face. Direct and guide us to God. May you be glorified. We pray this through Christ. Amen. I'd just like to open it up if there are any comments.